Good afternoon and thank you everybody for joining us at this afternoon's webinar when we're going to be looking at the details and the challenges and the opportunities around banking payment fraud, looking at best practice and solutions to fight financial crime. The webinar is hosted by our friends and colleagues from NetGuardians and moderated by Finextra. And my name is Gary Wright. I'm the head of research at Finextra. And as I say, thank you very much for joining us. It's a very topical discussion, and we're going to get into a whole series of debates and conversation around it. Um, but, but if we just think about putting it into some context, what we're looking at in this digital age where everything is instant, that's great for customers, gives them choice of provider, gives them choice of service, gives them choice of product. Um, but against all of that, it also opens new doors and opportunities for those that are less inclined to provide the best services to customers. Those that are looking to defraud and deceive the customers of banks. Not the people that hack into systems, but the people that just look at weaknesses in process and how best they can exploit it for financial criminal gain. And we're going to talk about that in some detail. We're going to look at this more sophisticated and growing market in this instant digital world. We're going to look at uh, some of the current ways in which these uh, processes are deployed and how they've grown up in a traditional way and, and are they fit for purpose anymore. And then we're going to look at you know, how we might go about tackling this uh, both individually uh, through technology and through developments in bank strategies and also maybe at an in industry level as well. And I'm joined by speakers who I'll introduce to you in a moment that will help us lead the conversation um, uh, for which you have an opportunity to raise questions and points as we go through by accessing the platform that you're using to push those into us so that we can receive from you any comments or thoughts you may have. There is also um, for, for you to download uh, a paper that uh, NetGuardians have produced on enterprise payment fraud and why, as I've just touched, uh, the industry needs to have perhaps a better, smarter approach to all of the ways in which uh, money is scammed from customers through this low-tech way of doing so. The, the people pretending to be someone from the bank, but they're not. Uh, fake email, fake invoices, and much more besides. So there's a paper there for you to download, and I encourage you to do so during the course of the, the webinar. The format is that we're going to ask each of the, the speakers uh, to set the scene, to take a few minutes out, um, to position and, and contextualize the situation, and then after that we're going to go into a deeper discussion, a more granular discussion around some of the issues that they will touch on and I've already mentioned. So let me introduce the speakers and you are familiar with them because of your registration and their details are available on the platform. And we have Joel, uh, the CEO of NetGuardians. Vinaya uh, is the Global Head Fraud Risk Oversight Institutional Clients Group at City Commercial Bank. And Niels, who's the Head of Fraud Prevention and Analytics the Global Fraud Management Team at Danske Bank. And thank you to all of you for joining us today, the prep you put into this, and the experience you're, you're willing to share uh, for all of this. So, so with that very brief opening uh, scene setting from me, um, I think we should move quite uh, swiftly into trying to put this into the context of how in this digitally enhanced transformational world, we manage at one level to promote ease and convenience and choice of service to customers, but equally know that those with other intents are looking to exploit that. And so maybe, Joel, I can turn to you first to, to set the scene from your perspective. I know you've got a, a couple of slides to set the scene as well. So. Joel NetGuardians, can I, can I ask you just to, to kick off with uh, some insights from your experience of this highly sensitive, sophisticated topic? Yes, yes, thank you, Gary, <clears throat> with pleasure. Uh, thanks a lot. Good uh, afternoon or morning, everyone. And uh, I would like, in order to, to start setting the scene, 
just to maybe start with the, the title of this webinar, which is around banking payment fraud. And what is a banking payment? Just to come on that topic, uh, which is key, I think, to start before looking a little bit at some statistics. Uh, banking payment at the end is a fund transfer that you initiate through your bank. So it's all the internet banking invoice you are paying every end of month, is the loans you are maybe uh, paying through your uh, internet banking account. As a corporate, it's all the bills you are paying uh, every day, every month to your, to your provider. So in other words, it means all the wire transfer you initiate through your bank. And why I'm insisting so much uh, on that, uh, it's because it's very different from credit card and merchant fraud. When looking, uh, as you mentioned, Gary, uh, at people using it in a bad way, so fraudster, and when you look at it from that perspective, it is very, very different from a credit card and merchant. And just to give an example of that, I'm pretty sure that all the people connected on that call I'm sure that 90% of you on the call, you already had a call from Visa, MasterCard, and so on for a suspicious or fraudulent payment. And I also believe that not many of you had a fraudulent transaction on your banking account, on your e-banking, when connecting on your e-banking, on your internet banking account. I'm not sure many of you add your uh, account dumped one night and so on. And I think uh, I'm showing on these slides that you can see on the screen a bit of statistics on that to compare banking payment fraud with merchant and credit card fraud. And I think that's very important to have that in mind for, for the conversation we're going to have uh, together. Basically, because if you look at the first column, the number of uh, fraud cases, there are plenty of fraud cases related to card and merchant, 2.7 million. Those statistics are, are just coming from UK finance, so it's just around UK in that case, where there are 80,000 cases per year on banking payment fraud, very, very few. But on the second column, when you look at the average amount, you can see that that are very small rivers for fraudster on credit card and merchant, while on internet banking and banking payments, people are trying just to dump the full account of the customer. So amount is way bigger compared to that. And when I will just end up by looking at the last column here on, on the slide, where you can see the trend. Credit card and merchant is a day-to-day -day business in regard of fraud activity, 16% growth per year. And when you look at banking and payment fraud, the increase is huge, is 50%, and it shows that fraudsters are really getting into this because, as you mentioned, Gary, with low-tech fraud, meaning people that are not hackers, uh, you have a lot of opportunities to trick people, to scam people, to get easy money. And the, the slide that is now highlighted on the screen, those statistics are just coming from the FBI claim, so the internet abuse claim from 2018. And here, what we did, we just classify the losses if they were related to IT security, so meaning more hackers, high tech fraud, and the one that were just related to more scams, social engineering, and so on. And what you can see, it's that almost more than the half of those losses that were recorded through FBI in the US in 2018 are just coming from scams, social engineering, and so on. So meaning that the weapon people use are just phone calls, fake invoices, and so on. So it's just to highlight the fact that this type of disease, uh, if I can say, is very much focused on the human behavior and not anymore 
to the technology, to the weaknesses, to, the, to, to, to hackers, people and fraudsters are going to the weakest point, which is very often still the case, the human, the way we access this new technology, the way we trust text messages we receive, the way we trust email we receive, all these business email compromise and so on. So uh, to conclude on, on that, uh, I would say I'm way more worried about my mobile phone, uh, so fake calls I receive, than a, be a big group of hackers somewhere, uh, if you look a little bit at how fraudsters are operating nowadays. And um, I think that we're going to have an interesting discussion around that. Thanks, Gary. Thank you, Joel. And good scene setting there. Uh, I think it's important to make the distinction that the growth of uh, actual financial crime is on the increase as we move more towards a digital environment. And it's still the, the weakest point in a process that people look to exploit. And, and you can see that in the more established, mature card market, it's reached one peak. And now there's a worrying trend emerging, particularly in this low-tech uh, environment, as we've just discussed. So we pick up on some of those points as we move forward. So thank you for that, uh, Joel. Benea, from your perspective, it would be nice to hear uh, some of the experiences and some of the thoughts that you have on, on, the, on the subject. So I invite you to share them with us. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Vinaya Parvate, and I've uh, been working within the banking industry for now close to 25 years across multiple businesses and different parts of the world. And uh, in the context of banking payment frauds, in these years, I have seen two significant trends uh, which have run in parallel. The first one is more from an operational perspective, where internal operations of banks and the client servicing has uh, become increasingly digital, uh, where manual touch points have become the exception rather than the norm. And the other trend which has run uh, in parallel with this, uh, which is relevant to our today's organization, is the increasing anonymity of fraudsters. Uh, so to add to what Joel and uh, Gary mentioned, we are seeing that there is greater use of technical tools by fraudsters to attack and steal from our clients and from banks. Um, and what this affords them is it has drastically reduced their personal risk. So to explain this very simply, if you try to think back 40 years ago, 50 years ago, for somebody to actually steal money, they had to take a gun, go to a bank branch uh, where everybody could see that somebody has come and uh, they were putting themselves at significant risk uh, personally, physically. Whereas these days, um, the people who steal uh, or commit fraud, uh, payment fraud, uh, they are not seen by anyone. And not just in person, even uh, digitally, there are many ways that they can hide their identity and they can hide their tracks. Uh, so uh, law enforcement and investigation forces also have a much uh, more difficult task in terms of being able to find them. And uh, for practitioners like us in banks, um, we have to constantly stay ahead in terms of the tools that we need to deploy to uh, be able to detect any early signs of such attempts and be able to respond to them quickly. So, so thank uh, you very I'll much. So thoughts, I'll hand it back to you. Yeah, no, thank you very much. And, and, and certainly interesting that the, the more sophisticated, silent way in which people can be persuaded that they're dealing with a bank, but in actual fact they're not, is a challenge. I think we want to come back also to law enforcement and what is the industry doing um, collectively 
And also another point that I want to pick up on later is the very question of how do banks stay ahead of the, the challenge here. So, so some points well received there. Thank you very much. And to close out this uh, first opening uh, session, Nils, some, some thoughts from you, please. Thank you very much, Gary, and uh, thank you everyone for for listening in. And uh, just a quick uh, background for those of you who do, does not know Danske Bank, we operate in the Nordic countries and in, in Northern Ireland. And I think actually that those introductory remarks from Joel and Vinaya really set the scenes of what is are we up against. So some of the uh, themes that I'll be discussing uh, throughout this session is mainly three areas that will be enablers of themes uh, to consider if we want to tackle this problem. And those three elements is A, the customer journey. Of course, as Gary also mentioned in the whole instant, instant development and uh, focus on digital solutions, that, that, that requires that the control set up in order to catch the fraud impacts the customer journey. We need to be uh, very much aware of that, but also due to the big efforts on awareness in this space and the expectations from the customers, we also need to be very deliberate about making specific uh, stops in the customer journey in order to give them the perce perception and, of course, the reality of uh, security when they do online banking. That's one of the themes. Second theme, that would be covering a lot on what I call the omnichannel approach. So how is it that we move away from having a silo-based approach, looking at credit cards, looking at online banding, looking at lending fraud, you name it, but how can we actually move towards having a more holistic approach uh, to fighting fraud, breaking down some of the silos that does exist, uh, especially within banking, uh, banking industry. So that is, uh, that is definitely a, a hot topic. And the third theme that I'll be, be covering, that is, well, of course the financial sector can do a lot here, but it's also a matter of how can we actually collaborate? How do we collaborate between banks, between public and private sector and authorities? So uh, that I can also give some, some perspectives on uh, later, in the, later in the discussions, because there is a lot of good examples out there. We just need to do it even more. I think that was the introduction from my side, Gary. Niels, thanks very much. Uh, and I think that the three points you raised there are both part of digital transformation, where you can have more holistic view of your customer engagement, and that's what's happening, and that may help in terms of spotting uh, behavioral trends that are not consistent. So we'll come up with that. And I think there's also a point we'll come back to on educating and uh, comforting the customers when it comes to how to recognize scams from legitimate um, bank discussions. So thank you all for a, a real good range of topics there uh, that we're going to uh, dive into in more detail as we go forward. And, and I do uh, encourage uh, everybody that's registered to post some questions or make observations as we go through this next stage of the of the webinar. So let me step back a little bit now, if I may. And Vinaya, if I could come back to you. Um, you, you touched on some of the issues around um, the ops process, you know, the client servicing and so on. Um, and we're talking about low-tech fraud, where thieves look to steal valuable data by targeting, you know, what they see as the least secure points of entry in this increasingly digital age, not everything can keep pace at the same time. So let, let's step back. What, what are the types of scams that you're aware of uh, that you're seeing? Um, and how are, how are the bank customers reacting? How aware are customers of this new low-tech opportunity for fraudsters to target? Benea. Thanks, Gary, for your question. Uh, I think the basic um, sort of shift that we need to understand when talking about this is um, that in the past, when a lot of payment instructions came into banks uh, through various manual mechanisms, whether by paper or by fax, uh, you know, or by phone, 
um, the point of compromise used to typically be at that stage in terms of authentication. When the banks used to scrutinize these instructions to try and um, confirm that it has come genuinely from the customer. Um, because, um, you know, a, a faxes um, could be recreated using old ones or signatures could be forged. And in the last, uh, I want to say primarily 10 years, what we've seen is majority of the instructions that are received now by banks come in through electronic channels whether it is through online banking platforms or through mobile applications, or even in the case of large um, companies or you know corporate clients, they may even have host-to-host -host connectivity between their own internal systems and the bank bank's systems. So it has become increasingly more difficult for the fraudsters to try and intercept the instructions at that stage. So what they have done is actually they have gone a step deeper. And that's the big trend that we see in terms of scams. So if you look at the last two, three years across the industry, we've seen an enormous increase in what is commonly called as business email compromise or CEO fraud. In this uh, modus operandi, what fraudsters do is they gain access to emails of trusted parties uh, to send fraudulent instructions. So it could be external parties like suppliers or internal parties like the CEO or the CFO or other senior management uh, within the client organization. For the FBI, uh, in the last three years, $26 billion has been lost in internationally because of such type of scams. So, um, or in the UK banking industry, you know, we tend to use the terminology called authorized push payment fraud or APP fraud, where the bank receives an authenticated instruction from the customer to push a payment. Unfortunately, it's getting pushed to the fraudster. So these scams uh, are basically the customer is getting duped through either social engineering or other means like business email compromise or what is called a RAT, which is a remote access trojan, which is used to take control of the victim's computer. Um, for social engineering, you know, the, my earlier point about anonymity, the fraudsters interact with uh, their victims on the phone or through live chat, uh, pretending to be, uh, you know, somebody from an official organization. Um, so the customer gets convinced that they're communicating with somebody legitimate, and they end up acting uh, on uh, what the fraudster is convincing them to do. So what happens from a bank perspective is that it comes in as a authorized push payment instruction. So this is, um, you know, one of the biggest problems today. And your point about awareness is absolutely spot on because that's really the biggest defense. I want to say awareness is increasing. Uh, you will find a lot of articles on this topic in newspapers and uh, you know um, social media. Uh, but the understanding of the extent of you know how they can manipulate uh, individuals is still not widely prevalent. Uh, the most vulnerable segments in society, like the elderly or those who may be, uh, you know, challenged in terms of financial literacy, they are the least familiar um, with these modes of fraud, and they are also the most likely to be targeted. And even amongst people who may be more educated, there tends to be an optimism bias, so they believe that they will not be targeted, and hence they may not be as vigilant as they should be. Um, so there is a lot to be done. Uh, and, you know, not just by banks, but even by um, law enforcement and government organizations, which I think the UK, um, you know, fraud action uh, force does try to do this quite a bit, but we have a long way to go. And maybe I can just add there, um, this is 
So speaking of uh, you know the awareness, and of course there is, I think uh, no matter what country you look at, there is of course this increased uh, awareness and, uh, and a more communication on this topic. But I think also relating back to the first theme I mentioned on uh, on the customer journey, you know, how is it that we can make this awareness impactful? How is it that we can actually, in these authorized push payment scenarios, target the customer with the exact precise information at the time when they're doing this action. So, so how is that we can utilize the data and the logics that we actually historically have been creating in order to stop a payment, but how, how can we actually utilize that also to, to create the awareness at the right point in time for, for the customers? Because, again, there's a lot of mass, uh, you can say, mass communication out there about some general rules, but I think... Uh, what will really distinguish this is uh, when we get the more uh, more targeted, as we also seen in, uh, in in multiple countries and multiple banks, is coming along. Thanks very much. And yeah. no, no, as, as we want to develop the the, the, the conversation. Um, so, Joel, do you want to to add to that? Yeah, yeah. I think it's make. It's a very good, um, a, a very good link to to our NAS uh, education. Um, uh, for instance, that uh, Vinaya mentioned, where there are some great initiatives uh, from uh, Interpol, Europol, Tel2 in UK is communicating a lot around this. The all local police, they all have this be careful um, campaign, huh, which means uh, BEC careful, business email compromise, being sure that people are careful around it. And I completely join uh, Neil's view where it's so easy to get tricked. Just to give you an example that uh, at Medjazians, we receive some fake invoice and so on. And wh when you look at them, uh, you have to think twice before... Uh, suspecting them as, as fake invoices and so on. And I remember also during our conversation, Gary, you mentioned about some calls, your fake calls you receive from your bank. And I mean, when you are in a situation under pressure and so on, and maybe they call you at the bad time on the train ride and so on, it's very hard because guys are very well trained. They have very good scenarios. They know you from your Facebook, LinkedIn page. They give a good context. And uh, they are just professionals. And I mean, it's very, very hard, even with a very good education, uh, to just get rid of that. And I completely join um, Neil's point where uh, being able maybe to notice the customer when you are inputting the payment to say, look, it's strange. Uh, that's also a kind of way to educate them, but on a real use case and not due on uh, internet advertisement and so on, which is hard then to relate it to a real life example uh, where you have professional targeting you. And I think maybe so also just up. to add. Oh. Yep, no, 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 please. Sorry. No, yeah. no, you, just, you, you, uh, you know, off, please. Yeah, and uh, I think there's some really good, uh, really good points. And I, and I think also it's it's um, it's so important. You know, we have a big focus on uh, awareness in terms of prevention and how is that we can actually you know completely prevent this. But as you also say, you know, the sophistication of this is just so um, surprising. You know, it's so well uh, orchestrated these types of attacks. So I think it's so important that we also in the communication towards, uh, for instance, corporates, uh, companies that we also move away from pro purely having this is the way you protect yourself against uh, fraud until also having a mind about, well, please also have the focus if you are hit. You know, how is that you react? How fast would you uh, realize it? Do you know how to react so that we move away from a mindset of let me just protect so it never happens until a mindset, let me prepare if it happens. And I think that's that's also a development that we should be Doing a much more in um, talking about uh, talking about awareness and the sophistication of the fraud that we actually are seeing. So let, let me pick up on that because I want to move that into the next question and come to Joel in a moment. But I think it's just worth summarising there that the the stats that Joel mentioned at the beginning and which you've endorsed it shows that this is on the increase and and clearly there's a level of awareness and education 
but I think we can only expect customers to be so aware and, and so informed, um, but however well informed they are, uh, Nils, I think the, the, the point you make there, the sophisticated level of organized crime now that is causing us a problem. And, uh, and we've got to start thinking about preventative measures inside organizations to alert earlier than happens now um, the, 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 the fact that something might be fraudulent. And obviously, there's industry levels as well. So, Joel, let me push on a little bit now because we've talked a lot about the, the, the issues, how the scams can come about, awareness, uh, and trying to to use uh, knowledge and improve processes and communication with customers to try and prevent it. But but as you said in your opening remarks, that the, the stats are quite staggering and growing. Um, and so we've just talked about education and other things, but, but let's talk about this at an industry level as well, because you, you mentioned Interpol and others. So what's happening there? And if, as they say, prevention is better than the cure, what steps are we taking individually and collectively, and are we taking enough? And what's the role of technology in all of this, to pick up on some of the points that uh, Vinaya uh, and, and Nils raised, raised there? So, Joel. Yeah, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a valid point because it's very true. Huh? Education is key. It's like when you are at school, huh? teaching, listening to teachers, looking at best practices is very key. But when you have to apply it in the real life, it's very often another story and in terms of scams and social engineering, even if you are very aware, uh, you get tricked as easily. So w where I foresee a good and great advantage of the technology is uh, enabling banks to be able to alert uh, customers. And uh, to join also Neil's statement of, on corporate, corporate are heavily targeted because you have a bit more to steal on a corporate account than a retail customer. And basically, their uh, education is one point, but then enabling the bank to flag strange payments is very, very key. And nowadays, uh, with AI and with uh, big data, enabling a way to learn from your customer behavior is becoming uh, the key for that. Because it means that with those technology, you enable the bank to understand the behavior of the corporate, the behavior of each retail customer, each corporate banking customers. And with that approach, you can easily flag some suspicious transactions. So taking the example of, for instance, a corporate being tricked by phone because someone is pressuring the finance department, maybe two, three people in the finance department. They get a call and the guy is putting a lot of pressure to process a very urgent payment, sending an email that is approved by the CEO of the company. It's look like his language and so on. And people are processing that payment that is going to a very weird location. They are, for instance, dealing, uh, for instance, in, um, in uh, Australian dollar. They are never dealing with Australian dollar. The time of, of the, the, the timing is very weird and so on. And these type of suspicious behavior are easily flagged, can be easily flagged from uh, the bank side, uh, having some uh, some of these uh, AI capabilities to be able to alert and double check with uh, the customer and ensure that, uh, as, uh, and as Neil mentioned, that the people that are under pressure, maybe they step back and they say, look, we got these alerts uh, or these callbacks from the bank. Uh, maybe we should double check on that. So it's kind of a part even of education but also a very much on the prevention, uh, on stopping the fraudulent payment and making sure people that are maybe under pressure on the phone with someone thinking who's very important and they need to process a payment for the CEO, to ensure that they step back, they calm down, they review this alert or they answer to this call back and uh, we ensure through that education plus really prevention because you stop the fence before they, they leave the bank. And that's where I would say 
technology nowadays can really help. And that's where we are seeing at our customer side, where we can really, at the end, reduce the number of payments they are blocking, making sure they are very much on the spot relevant. You don't block a lot of them. You just block the relevant one, and you bring uh, education with prevention. And, and I think that's where technology can really help today. And I think just to add to that, because I completely agree, and, 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 and you can say the whole whole shift towards uh, customer profiling, some are, of course, already there and others are on the way, but that whole shift of customer profiling, that is actually also what, in my view, is will be the driver to having the, what I call the more omnichannel uh, perspective, because we need to break down these silos where we either look at online banking or cards or whatever fraud use case we have, and we need to look at the customers. That is much easier said than done. Because, of course, everyone is fighting with legacy systems or setups and have been built upon uh, product. Uh, you know, everything has been designed according to products or channels and so forth. And that's what we need to, uh, to bring down in order to have a, as efficient and effective uh, preventive setup as possible. So that's what I call the, the omni-channel strategy. Yes, and, and, and I think it's fair to say that banks, independent of looking at the low-tech fraud, they're trying to have a, a consistent uh, view of customer engagement and service and expectation across channels anyway. So it's not as if we're creating the omni-channel strategy to prevent the fraud. It's happening anyway, but how does that also help with customer behavior, both from the positive elements of customer service and also the negative bits of, um, of challenges because of the financial crime market there. Um, I suppose, Lil, just come, come back to you on that point, because one of the questions is, you know, you, you mentioned in your opening remarks uh, about friction. Everybody talks about taking friction out of a process, but actually I'm comforted by having some friction if it's going to give me some assurance or comfort that just in a, a transactional sense, someone saying, hey, you know, this is a little bit unusual. You're sending a larger amount of money, which Joel referred to. So how, how, do, the, how do you approach the, the way that the market is opening up and the ease and the convenience and the speed by which you do things, and also at the same time in that instant world, put friction back in so that you can identify unexpected behavior, which may not be fraudulent, of course, uh, at the same time, what's the, what's your thoughts on that one? It's a very good question, and again, as with a lot of the other subjects, very very difficult in practice. Because at the um, at the end of the day, <clears throat> if we take a look at it, let's take a look at it from a customer perspective, saying, okay, why why are they actually engaging with a bank? Well, banks might have some nice uh, solutions, some products, and so forth, but at the end of the day. One of the core elements is to keep your money safe, right? So with that argument uh, in, say, uh, you know, that whole vault mindset, how do we take that into a digital, digital world? So with that uh, statement, you know, there is to a certain degree a need for the customers to get friction. But that friction, how do we identify the good friction versus the bad friction? And uh, there's no doubt that it also varies a lot across different customer segments and countries and so forth because um, they want to have security. They don't want the unnecessary security. Um, so it's a very, very difficult balance to strike. But I think a lot of it actually starts out with just realizing that, you, that your bank or, that you, or your customers actually want to have some friction. So uh, that's that's the very first step, and then uh, of course it's a long journey to to strike the right uh, the right balance. Yeah, yeah it, it is. is. Uh, uh, can I add to? So, so, sorry, well, Naya here. I was just going to add to that that I think uh, when we talk about uh, you know introducing back friction, I think absolutely that is. Uh, I think. A common thinking right now a lot around the industry that we do need a certain amount of friction 
the beauty is that these days we have a lot of tools where um, we uh, we can actually um, optimize that friction. And what I mean by that is bring in interventions based on the risk characteristics of the activity that is going on. So, you know, earlier there was a reference to the value of the payment, which could be used as a criteria. Similarly, uh, you know, these days, especially as people transact using mobile applications, there can be information based on um, is this the usual device that a client, uh, you know, sends instructions from, or is it a usual location that the client is based in? Um, information like this can be used to uh, optimize the friction. Uh, the heart of all of this is a high level of engagement between the bank and the client. And uh, in client segments where clients are willing to actually have a high level of engagement, I think we as banks are able to provide them a much higher level of security with limited friction at the time of transacting because we can predefine certain things. So for example, if I'm going to pay my electricity company every month, I can set it up once and then not uh, you know, need to go through many hoops every month when I pay the bill. So that's you know, just a simple example of where uh, that friction can be actually uh, the timing of the friction also matters from a client convenience perspective. And Joel, I think you had a, a point you were going to make. Yeah, I think that uh, friction is raising a lot of uh, a lot of uh, discussion, and I, I fully understand why. Huh? When I look a little bit at the different projects we run in many many banks, uh, basically, if you you look at what people are usually using is a very much a rule-based approach that I would say the first common thing you, you start putting in place. Maybe you have an anti-money laundering solution, very much rule-based. You start seeing fraud. You say, oh, let me look, look at it. I will add a few rules that are not AML oriented, but that are fraud prevention oriented. You start adding rules, rules, rules. And with rules, and customer friction, you start having then a huge number of payments that you block. You always block the same. We have some customers telling us, look, we, we, we started with these small rules. We are ending up with many, many rules nowadays. And customers are calling us, telling us like, okay, look, please stop blocking this payment in Nigeria. I'm an oil trading company. I'm buying and paying everyday supplier in Nigeria. So stop blocking it every day, please. And just due to rules and exception management and so on, the friction is huge. So uh, we can see also many, many banks suffering a lot of, from the friction perspective because the, the first usual step is kind of uh, relying on existing kind of financial crime solution in place and so on, instead of looking uh, sometimes as the next step, which is more uh, AI driven, uh, as uh, Niels mentioned, uh, using this profiling of customer to really then be more relevant. And what does it mean being more relevant is mean uh, frictionless. So relevant payments you block, and when you block a payment, uh, from our perspective, the customer should say thank you, even if it's not a fraud, because he's seeing it as a too strange. And same for me when Visa is calling me for a suspicious transaction that is not a fraud, it's just that I'm traveling a lot. I'm happy to get this call and say, look, they are they are taking care of me, but they are not calling me every day, and I'm very happy with that. They call me when... Uh, even me, I would have uh, called myself and uh, stepped back on it. So uh, I think that's where the friction is uh, is very key. Okay, so so let me um, summarize that in a in a sense, and and then come on to to you, Niels, for the, the, the sort of final part of the conversation we're having here. One of the things that uh, obviously. Is potentially confusing for ill-informed customers is that how do they deal with the fraudulent contact they have 
versus the banks now are suddenly contacting them more regularly. And how do they know it's the bank versus the fraud, fraudulent um, um, company or individual? It, it strikes me, and it's one of the questions that actually has come out, how, how do you know who you're actually dealing with in this very confused uh, instant world and, and that may be something that we you know we, we, we come back to in a second but but Nils if I come on to you because you know we, you, we we've touched on the customer journey and we've touched on omnichannel um, uh, Danske Bank is, a, is like many is a very digitally focused bank in the Nordics which is heavily cashless and uh, has, has constantly moved to next gen of technology and 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 recognize the customer behavior there so so from your point of view i suppose um how do you uh, strategically recognize that current processes whether it's you know account opening or aml how 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 do you now revise your strategies and plans to tackle the issues that we've talked about and the other point that, that cropped up here and you raised it what, what does the industry need to do to uh, talk about how it can share the learnings that they have individually or the input that it gets from people like Interpol? How can they best bring that together to, to help each other recognize the trend and the sophistication of scams that are out there? So from your perspective, how is that being dealt with in the Nordics? That's a very good, uh, very good question, Gary. And I think uh, let me focus on the on, on the collaboration part. And there's no doubt that, uh, of course, as you say, the Nordic is uh, is uh, is uh, not cashless, uh, but uh, uh, one of the areas with uh, less use of cash, at least. And we have some really yeah. good examples of how we collaborate uh, across um, the industries. Of course, there's similar in UK, and there's also in, in other markets as well. But I think a core here is. First of all, in order to make collaboration happen, you need to dare to do it. We also need to, of course, one thing is to share uh, intel, you know, sessions like today where we discuss what is good practice, etc. But how do we get to the stage where we actually are starting to share hardcore data within the realms of the regulation that we allowed? As a good example, in the Nordics, we have what we call the uh, Nordic Financial Cert, uh, which covers across the Nordics and where we, for instance, share Mule accounts. So there's similar setup in the UK where you, where you share it among uh, financial institutions. But here we, we have a setup where we also uh, cross uh, boundaries, uh, uh, geographical uh, boundaries. That is a, that's an efficient uh, method. And uh, of course, that requires a lot. It requires a lot of discussion in regards to regulation and uh, the will, willingness from the parties involved to actually get something out of this. I think another interesting example is, you know, one thing is looking across you can say, the financial industry, but what is it for, for, for good examples you have uh, between, for instance, banks and, and other private sector or with the authorities, as you say. And I think also, I think it was uh, Joel mentioning you know, some of the good campaigns coming out of Europol, for instance. That's a really good example where that's also uh, provided input by uh, private sector. Um, but there's no doubt that uh, if we can more operationalize the collaboration between authorities and, for instance, banks, we'll get a lot out of it. Um, and that is both in terms of, you know, how do we provide the most meaningful information to authorities? You know, how is it that they, uh, you know, focus on the right cases? We all know that uh, authorities might not be able to investigate the uh, all cases within a day, right? So how do we actually uh, provide the information to them to ensure that they focus on the right stuff? How do we actually also get the, the feedback from them um, so we can also improve our processes? We also have some, uh, there's also been in the media some, some, some good cases where um, the authorities actually succeeded in, uh, in, in, in catching the CEO criminals um, because at the point where the customer actually discovered the fraud, it was not, it was not, uh, no, the fraudsters didn't know it yet. So how could you actually collaborate and and and, and catch uh, the criminals? Because at the end of the day, of course, we want to uh, prevent fraud from happening from our customers. But what we also really want 
is to those that succeed that would get them behind bars. So we need to collaborate with the authorities here. Um, but that's easier said than done, also due to regulation. No, it, it, it certainly is easier said than done. And, and, and in many ways, we're trying to pin down an unknown at the moment because we know scams are happening. Uh, and where will they go in the future? Uh, Fenea, what's your thought on, 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 on that uh, point? At the end of the day, for uh, it in today's scenario where we are really talking about payment fraud, for a fraudster to successfully carry out a fraud, they need uh, to have some banking facilities or some financial services uh, supporting them, right? So they need to have a bank account or a wallet or some place where they can uh, get the money into. And that's where I think cooperation and collaboration across the industry and with law enforcement becomes critical because unless we can uh, essentially, you know, completely keep out criminal elements from the financial system, uh, it, it's like a game of whack-a-mole. Right, so we may, uh, so we have to work together. I don't think it's a matter of choice. I think it's more a matter of us figuring out how to do that in the context of all the, you know, regulatory and other um, sort of privacy-related restrictions that we operate within. And and Joel, you 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 mentioned Interpol and so on. Are you seeing? Uh, activity that comforts you in terms of the the enforcement bodies coming together as well as the regulatory uh, uh, organizations yeah my, my view on that is that the, the organizations such as Europol Interpol are great in coordinating uh, case investigation because it's a borderless nowadays so it's not because you have a bank in the Nordics that has an issue that investigation need to happen in the Nordics. It's maybe completely other part of the world. And uh, I think that's a great help for those organizations such as Interpol is just a, a great help for, for that. And uh, where, where I'm seeing uh, more on data exchange such as what we touch base on Mule accounts and so on, the big challenge here is the regulation how we can uh, be proactive, quick, and efficient on sharing such type of data while, you know, uh, complying with the regulation and avoiding, for instance, to set up a mule account uh, in a list that is maybe not at all a mule account, so uh, starting to unbank some people uh, that uh, are genuine, uh, genuine people and not mule account uh, guys. So that, that's where this balance is, is very uh, tricky, and for sure Interpol is working a lot on that, huh, on making sure they can coordinate case, uh, share information, exchange information by still uh, complying with all regulation framework that are different uh, in Sweden, in Switzerland, in France, and so on. So it's a lot of work around it, and it brings a bit of slowness uh, on that. And that's where I believe a mix of collaboration plus technology can really help. And uh, yeah, that would be um, my view on, on this topic where uh, it's hard to be quick, uh, uh, but that's the fact of the, of the regulation in, in that way. So the, we're coming to the end now, and, and it's been a fascinating conversation. And for those of the registered, you have a, a last few minutes to to look at and download the paper that uh, is posted under the Net Guardian's uh, brand. I encourage you to do that. Nils, a, a kind of question, not trying to be unfair, but you know, it strikes me that is every bank looking at how they can tackle this issue of, we'll call it low-tech fraud, because if I go back 18 months or, or so, for some banks, they didn't see that they had any obligation or any liability there if their customers fell foul of a scam, are you now seeing that actually they have a greater obligation than that now? And are you seeing that consistently across uh, the banking industry or is it still uh, isolated in, in some pockets? Do you have a view on that, uh, 
That's a very, okay. very good question. Of course, we uh, can say that within that space, the most mature area is most likely the UK area. There's a contingency reimbursement plan and, and these kind of things. But I actually think the most interesting part about um, you know, how banks are evolving into taking the, the authorized push payments seriously is from what strategic view are you combating fraud? Are you doing it to reduce your bank losses? Are you doing it more as a compliance, a tick box exercise? Are you seeing it actually as a business enabler? And I actually, and I think that's so, so important because it actually has quite a good uh, consequence on, on how you maybe historically have been looking at these types of, um, of scams. Because yeah, if you purely have been looking at what is what is what is your own losses as a financial institution, you might not have paid a lot of attention to uh, authorized uh, push payments. Whereas if you have had a, a more business view or customer facing view, you might have taken it more seriously, uh, and also taking the customer loss into account there. So um, I think it, it, a lot of it comes down to how you've actually approached it in your own in- institution. But of course, as we now see with the specific example in the UK, there's no doubt that uh, you know if we don't take that problem seriously, do then the regulators will just uh, enforce us to do it. So uh, why not uh, just uh, do something about it? Uh, because it makes sense. Yep. No, I, I, I thank you for that. And we, we are coming to the end. And, and, and jo- Joel, I'll come back to you in a moment just for a, a couple of closing remarks. But but. Um, I think just from my perspective, looking at this uh, and moderating the session, I think we've covered a whole range of topics around a very specific, sophisticated and growing element of scams and um, ways in which uh, customers of uh, banks are duped into giving sensitive bank information. And I think it's also interesting that uh, we shouldn't see this as just solutions in isolation of digital transformation. Banks are looking to become more engaged across multiple channels with the behaviors of customers to provide better service, to to provide more information on data and behaviors. So, So if that is coming in as a benefit, it can also be deployed to look at the irregular ways in which customers are initiating payments, of which there will be a percentage that are fraudulent. So um, I think it's uh, been a great conversation. We've really kicked it around. I would like to thank everybody that's sending questions. Uh, We don't answer them specifically, but I know that we've covered a lot of them. Um, And you've obviously had the opportunity to download the report as well. So I'd like to thank everybody for their time joining us on the webinar uh, today. And, and, And Joel, a, a final uh, thought or two from you? Yeah, uh, from on behalf of NetGuardians, big, big thanks for uh, to Finextra for hosting this conversation. Thanks a lot also uh, to Vinaya, Niels, for your insight and time uh, during that session. And uh, as we saw, uh, scams are just increasing and I believe, uh, as we discussed, uh, technology can bring uh, the gap between education and prevention, and I think there are some great uh, steps uh, steps forward we can do in the market. And uh, thanks a lot, uh, Vinaya, Niels, and you, Gary, for for this session. Well, I I would echo echo, echo my thanks to the speakers as well. Yes, and uh, so, as I say, We haven't exhausted this conversation because there's a lot more to be talked about, but I think we've raised the level of awareness and the opportunities that we should be thinking about individually and collectively as an industry uh, and a conversation to be continued. Um, So I'd like to sign off now by thanking again everybody for joining us, including uh, speakers, and uh, I'm going to close down the webinar now. Thank you everybody for joining us and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.